To anyone who attended Wheaton College from the 1950s through the mid-1990s, the name of Arthur Holmes has a familiar, even an endearing ring to it. In just a minute or two, you'll be hearing from Art directly. In this talk, you'll be able to see and hear those things that made Art such an enduring figure in Wheaton's history and made him such an important person to so many of us who knew him as a student, as a faculty leader, as a colleague, and as a writer. In this video, Art brings to bear upon a scriptural text his vast learning in his own discipline of philosophy, as well as his deep and broad knowledge of the scriptures and of the history of Christian thought. In all that he did, and in this chapel talk in particular, you can witness Art's concern to bring deep and complex truths to bear upon the most intimate and important questions of human life. Questions having to do with personal identity, with our relationship to God, with our lives together in society, and with our deepest longings for justice, for restoration, and reconciliation. Art was a wise and profound man, and a man of generous spirit. I hope you enjoy this visit with him, and I am fully confident that you will profit from it. May God be glorified, and may we give thanks to him for this man who served so brilliantly in our midst. Well, walking across this platform brings a lot of nostalgia back. I think I have done it too often. It's good to be here. Uh, I, I'd like to ask you this morning to reflect with me on one simple phrase. A phrase that the Apostle Paul uses in writing to the Colossians. The treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Have you thought what that means? What is he talking about? Is it just what we sometimes call spiritual wisdom? Having to do with our knowledge of the gospel? Uh, Paul does use that phrase, at least in the Revised Standard Translation, in the um, first chapter in the opening prayer of that epistle. Or when he talks of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, does he have something more in mind than what we usually mean by that phrase, spiritual wisdom? What are these treasures? Uh, in my reflection on it, I'm captivated first by the value judgment in speaking of wisdom and knowledge as a treasure, or in the plural, multiple pleasures, treasures, pleasures too. Uh, reminds me of the uh, book of Proverbs and the saying there that wisdom is better than jewels. That's something worth considering, ladies, in looking for a jewel for your left hand third finger. Wisdom should take priority over jewels. The Old Testament wisdom literature is full of this sort of thing. I remember as a student here at Wheaton, back in the, well, prehistoric days in the 1940s, 
I remember a Chinese chapel speaker when we had chapel over in Pierce who um, used to urge us to read a chapter of the book of Proverbs every morning. Pretty sage advice. And during World War II, there was an edition of the New Testament and Proverbs that was widely distributed to servicemen. Proverbs, wisdom, better than jewels. Or think of the book of Ecclesiastes and the way in which it addresses all sorts of things in life. Money seeking, wealth, pleasure, death, dying. And at this stage in life I'm particularly bemused by the final chapter where there is a graphic description worthy of Shakespeare that describes the aging person. The pillars shake and so forth. Vivid. But wisdom in this Old Testament wisdom literature has to do with seeing all of life in relationship to God. There is an apocryphal book in the Hebrew literature, The Wisdom of Solomon, in which it is said that wisdom pervades nature and brings order to the creation. Brings order to your life, too. And to all of our learning. The treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But Paul is writing not to a Jewish audience, but to a city in the Hellenistic world. And in the Hellenistic culture of those days, the main purpose of education was the acquisition of wisdom. Yeah. The kind of understanding and lasting values that were passed on from generation to generation through the liberal arts, as they had become known. Wisdom. So in the world of that time, uh, they included in the liberal arts what they called grammar, which was really language and literature. And they all read Homer. Not just read it quietly, but out loud, reciting the speeches, trying to capture the emotions of their heroes, reenacting their deeds until they began to internalize the values that drove them and began to assimilate the wisdom that was passed along in that body of literature. As the late as Saint Augustine in the fourth century, he tells of having to study Homer in school. Oh, his Greek wasn't good enough that he could really enjoy it, but um, speaking Latin, he studied Virgil instead. And then when he started teaching, he taught Virgil. The aim wisdom. And uh, it was said similar things about the other of those early liberal arts. Geometry, it was said, sows seeds of justice through its emphasis on equality and proportion. Astronomy teaches us that everything has its place and everybody a function that is important. Music can calm the soul 
and prepare it for virtue. And philosophy? Well, in those days, that word was sometimes used as a catch-all for liberal learning. Philosophy was understood in terms of the literal meaning of the word. Philosophia, the love of wisdom. That was the purpose of education. The pursuit of wisdom. Was that on Paul's mind when he spoke of these treasures of wisdom and knowledge? Notice that he speaks of all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All of the treasures. Do they include literature? The sciences? Music? Philosophy? Well, let's put this phrase in its context. It's just a phrase lifted out of a long sentence. And in that larger sentence, he's speaking of, get this, the riches of assured understanding. Notice there the implicit, implicit reference to truth, which is the topic of this weekend's philosophy conference. The riches of assured understanding of God's mystery in Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. How can literature and mathematics and the sciences and music and philosophy all be in Christ? Whatever does that mean? Well, who is this Christ anyway? Now, that's exactly Paul's point. Because in introducing the letter that he was writing, he spoke explicitly in the first chapter about Jesus Christ. Hear these words. He is the visible image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created. In heaven and on earth. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, the firstborn from the dead, that in all... English translation says everything because it's smoother, but it's the same word, all. That in all he might be preeminent. In him, all the fullness of God dwells to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. Now, did you get the all eight times? Seven of them about the all things in creation. All. Seven times. Jesus Christ is the creator of all, the sustainer of all, the one who holds the creation together in some kind of ordered unity. The reconciler of all things to God. The Lord of all to be preeminent in all, and that all must include the liberal arts. 
all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are by him and for him and in them all he intends to be preeminent. He is, as a former colleague of mine teaching here at Wheaton used to say, the cosmic Christ. The Christ of the cosmos. In him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You know, I think St. Augustine glimpsed something of what this means. He was a liberal arts teacher before he became a bishop. And in one of his earlier works, he records a discussion that he had, a Socratic style discussion. He used that method in teaching. A Socratic style discussion he had with his students about all seven of those early traditional liberal arts. In each case, he tried to show that this particular discipline depends on the order that God has built into the creation. Yeah. That Jesus Christ, the divine Logos, by whom and for whom are all things, had built into the creation. God conceived it first, then implemented it in his creative work. And so all the disciplines depend on the way in which God has made things to function, to be. Augustine says later on that he had wanted to write a separate book on each of the seven liberal arts, but he only got one done on music or rather half of one, because what he got done was on rhythm and the half on melody he never got done. You can read it in the library. I tried to. My mathematics really wasn't as good as Augustine's. But I did at least get this, that rhythm draws on mathematical relationships and a mathematical order that is inherent in the world of potential sound. And so you have to say that not even the canons that burst out in that classic overture take God by surprise. Music. God conceived it first in creating the world and creating us with the capacity to use this. So it is with each of the disciplines you're involved in and with your major. The underlying truth about the physical world and the human world and the underlying possibilities about the creative arts are known first to Christ as creator, sustainer of order, reconciler, Lord of all. In him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's why I get excited about that phrase. In the early church, it was said that all truth is God's truth, no matter where it's found. This is what they were thinking. And the task of the church is to regather those fragments, even from unlikely places, and reunite them to the body of the whole from which they have been falsely torn. Well, let me make 
three applications of this for us today. The first is obvious, and uh, it was already made by the chaplain in his opening prayer. It is Paul's own application in the Colossian letter as you read it right through. Approach all of life from this Christ-centered point of view. In the verses that follow, chapter 2, verse 8, you remember he um, uh, contrasts two philosophies. Now, that's a text that a Christian philosophy teacher lives with all the time. Beware of philosophy, says the King James Version. It's not a good translation. <laughs> because there is a definite article. And the definite article in Greek has a demonstrative force. He's saying, beware of that philosophy. He's pointing to something that was confusing, misleading the Colossian church. A sort of eclectic philosophy more in line with some of the philosophical traditions of Hellenistic times than with what he himself was saying. So he says, beware of that sort of philosophy, which is simply traditional these times, rather than that which is in accordance with Christ. Yes, the Christ he's introduced as creator, sustainer, Lord, reconciler, preeminent in all things. Two ways of looking at things but approach all of life with the Christ-centered way of looking at things. Approach all you do that way, Paul says. And he goes on to talk about the things which should be affected. Our behavior, our relationships, our families, our relationship to Masters and slaves, shall we say, in the workplace. All of those things, you see, should relate to the wisdom vested through Christ in the way in which he made this creation. It's tremendously important these days. Good and right are not just traditional human mores, but like everything else, they relate ultimately to God's purposes in making the world as he did. So the first application, approach all of life with this Christ-centered perspective. Second application, here is a basis for objective truth. In today's relativistic climate, everything seems to become a matter of perspective, including truth itself. As Dr. Wood said in introducing the topic, in introducing last evening speaker. Uh, truth is sometimes defined these days at whatever you can get away with saying. Or whatever people might agree on. Now, I have no problem in saying that human knowledge comes, at least at first, loaded with the perspective of history and culture and ethnicity and gender and one's religious faith. After all, the apostle himself says that we see through a glass darkly and we know in part. 
But the apostle also implies that we still know the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, assured understanding. Wisdom and knowledge. So we have to recognize that while ours may be a, a human perspective on the truth, to some extent relative to where we stand historically and personally, what we have is still a knowledge, a relative knowledge perhaps, but a knowledge of absolute objective truth. About 25 years ago at a professional conference, I ran into a, a former student, a Wheaton alumna, who had finished her PhD in philosophy at Yale, married another philosopher, who was at the forefront of discussions then in the philosophy of language that related to matters of meaning and truth. It was so long ago that nobody had ever used the word postmodern, to my mind. But as we were talking, we uh, got to talking about the influence of theism, belief in God, in, on philosophy, on philosophical thinking. And Nan said this, and I've never forgotten it. At least it gives you a locus for truth. Belief in God gives you a locus for truth. A place, a location to which you can point where truth resides in the mind of the maker. Yeah. The maker who conceived it all, knows it all. We don't, he does. A locus for truth, a point of reference. Perhaps you've heard the way in which one contemporary philosopher puts it. The idea of objective truth is a carryover from days when people believed in God. A carryover? Well, that implies where he is. But he's right in this. that the mind of God is indeed the ultimate locus of truth. So that in a sense, at least one of the things the Christian means when he says that something is true is God knows it is. Or God's, God knows that's the way things are. Something of that sort. God made it that way. That's why it's true. You see, that's part of what's involved in the adage that all truth is God's truth, no matter where it's found. Well, a third application then is this. Wisdom and knowledge are treasures because they can enrich our worship. Augustine said one other thing that sounds sort of funny. He said we should plunder the Egyptians. What he's doing is likening the Christian pursuit of wisdom and knowledge in liberal learning, liking that to the Israelites at the Exodus, who plundered the Egyptians of their treasures so that they could take them to the worship of God to whom those treasures belonged in the first place. Now, uh, don't stumble now over whatever ethical questions pop up in your minds. Uh, 
but think of what he's trying to say by means of that analogy. You see. He's saying that the treasures of wisdom and knowledge can enrich our worship. Yeah. Medieval scholars followed through on that in very literal ways. For the contemplation of God's creation led to the contemplation of God's wisdom which led to thanksgiving and adoration of a God who is all wise, all good, all powerful. The heavens declare the glories of God. Day after day they speak. Night after night they tell what they know. Yes. They enrich our worship. And so a doxological emphasis, as we call it, doxology, praise, a doxological emphasis developed in Christian higher education in the Middle Ages and on thereafter. I think that was the precedent of College Chapel. Oh, we tend to say, forget your studies when you come to chapel. Frankly, I could never pray that prayer in the 43 years I taught here. I always wanted to bring my studies to chapel as an offering to God, as an expression of my thanksgiving, as a point of reference in worshipping him. We tend to learn for utility's sake what I can do with it. Not for contemplation's sake. How it enriches worship. So cultivate a contemplative approach to learning. If all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are indeed in Christ, then those treasures that we acquire can and should enrich our worship of him. Let's pray together, shall we? God of all wisdom, all knowing, altogether good, we confess that you as creator and Lord of all are the source of all we can ever know. We thank you. We adore you for who you are, as well as for what you have done. And we thank you for Jesus Christ, God incarnate, who has revealed you to us and reconciled us to yourself and made us one in that body the church. Accept our thanksgiving. Accept our praise. Through him, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.